tillites and chalk beds. Can certain geological features be explained by a global flood? This week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Now this week on Creation Magazine Live, our topic is, can certain geologic features be explained by a global flood? Yes, many Bible skeptics have claimed that there's no evidence of a global flood as right. recorded in the Bible, when in fact the evidence is overwhelming. Yeah, creationists have, have been showing for years now that rapid deposition of hundreds of meters of waterborne sediments resulting in rapid burial and rapid fossilization, rapid fossil formation, is the most obvious explanation for the rock record. Not slow and gradual processes championed by, by most evolutionists. Yeah, to the point where modern evolutionary uh, geologists are now uh, actually promoting neocatastrophism, right? right. That, that uh, admits yep. that many of the geological features we see today must have been deposited in giant floods. Right, not the giant flood. Right, right, not the giant flood, just a, a series of them. And we did a show on that a while back called Neocatastrophism yep. versus Uniformitarianism. That was in season three, episode 23, and the link for that is, uh, is on the screen here. Right, so in order to discredit the idea of a global flood, what evolutionists will typically do is trot out some very specific arguments that they feel creationists can't explain adequately, as if that will explain away all of the other evidence that supports <laughs> it. Unfortunately, many Christians have, have bought in to these, these bad arguments. That's right. Now, um, the specific arguments we're going to be discussing today are, are tillites, which are interpreted as the left-behind rubble from glaciers and chalk beds, uh, which are huge layers of calcium carbonate, like the famous White Cliffs of Dover in southern England. Uh, of course, there are other arguments against flood geology, like paleosols, which are, are dealt with on the massive creation.com website. So yeah. that's a fantastic resource. So, so, so check it out. It's not just the ones that we're going to be dealing with today. Yes. Now, we won't be able to go into much more than an overview today in the short time that we have, but we'll put up some links to articles that will provide more details if you want to dig in a little bit further. Right. So what we'll do is start with, the, with what the feature is and why long-age geologists say it's a challenge to flood geology and then give you the biblical explanation right. showing that it really isn't a problem. That's right. Okay, well, let's start with uh, tillites and we'll go from there. Tillites are assumed to be the lithified equivalents of glacial till, which is basically supposed rubble from glaciers found in the strata of the earth. Now, the reason these tillites are su a supposed problem for flood geology is that many uniformitarian scientists postulate a number of long-lasting ice ages having occurred over hundreds of thousands of years. So the late Paleozoic Ice Age in southern Africa, that, that's probably the most noticeable Right, so the, the question is, how do you have various till deposits from various ice ages in varying rock layers including right. I, included in what creationists say most likely got laid down in the course of the year-long flood? A lithified rock is supposed to have hardened by pressure and not the results of being cemented together in a watery environment. Right. Well, as usual, the answer comes when you actually question the... Um, the assumptions, the assumptions yeah. behind the conclusion. Could these deposits um, claimed to be left over from glaciation periods have been caused by other processes? Other, other, the good question. Yeah. Well, a classic uh, supposed late Precambrian tillite is the Biganjarga tillite of northern Norway. It overlies a rock layer in which two strea directions, uh, that has two, two different strea directions, two different scratches in the rock. Right. A sharp northwest uh, southeast set overlying a faint east-west set. Uh, that were, were embossed on, on the, that these were embossed on the sandstone below. Striations, by the way, are grooves or scratch marks, ridges in the rocks. That's, that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. Now, three specific features identified this as a supposed tillite. So, firstly, one, two sub-parallel sets of layers are supposedly indicative of, of glaciation. Okay, all right, and uh, number two, uh, one author claimed to have uh, observed 
striated and, and fac uh, faceted clasts within the tillite. Right. And three, the top layer of the tillite is composed of thin beds containing clasts larger than the thickness of the bedding, which is reminiscent of dropstone varvites. And dropstones are the isolated fragments of rock found within uh, finer grained water deposited sedimentary rocks. So they range in size from small pebbles to boulders. Now these three characteristics of the, of the Bigginjarga tillite are the main diagnostic features for an ancient ice age. And so most geologists accepted uh, without question that the tillite was a remnant of the late Precambrian ice age. Okay, so how do creationists understand this? We'll be back in just a minute to show you how. Most people know that pollen can cause problems for those who suffer from hay fever. But did you know that pollen is also a major problem for the evolutionary interpretation of the fossil record? Since the 1960s, the scientific literature has reported the presence of pollen and spores within a rock layer called the Horema Formation in South America. This formation is supposedly over 550 million years old, yet according to evolutionary theory, flowering plants that produced pollen didn't evolve for another 390 million years. So why do we find pollen in the fossil record so long before the first flowering plants appear. The simplest explanation is that the fossil record doesn't represent the evolution of life on this planet over eons of time, but it's better explained as a consequence of the year-long global flood of Noah and its aftermath. This is recorded in the book of Genesis, chapters 6, 7 and 8. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, if you just tuned in, this week we're talking about can certain geologic features be explained by a global, global flood? And in particular, we're talking right now, we'll get to another one in a minute, about tillites. Right, and specifically we're talking about the Bigginjarga uh, tillite, which yes. is uh, supposedly a, a slam dunk example of, of these things. So how do creationists explain this? Well, recently a more in-depth analysis has indicated that this classical tillite is very likely a submarine debris flow. Yeah, underwater debris flow. Yeah, yeah scientists investigating this discovered that this feature was found to have been made by rocks sliding along soft, stands, uh, soft uh, sandstone, specifically some, uh, because some of the clasts are embedded in the sandstone. Moreover, clasped imprints on the sandstone have the same random spacing as the tillite above. Right. Now, the sandstone had been assumed to be lithified, which means a process of hardening without water, and uh, older than the tillite, which was supposedly another argument against flood geology. So the sandstone had been dated 150 million years old, but because of these soft sediment deformation features, the investigators now suggest that this time gap is not real. Well, uh, go figure. Okay. <laughs> Also, the matrix and the class in the tillite are rounded. Uh, this, this is very unlike glacial till. Mm -hmm. uh, the rocks in the tillite uh, show flow layers around the class, indicating underwater mass flow origin. Marine deposits are, are also closely associated with the, with the so-called tillite. Yeah. Uh, investigators Jensen and Wolf Peterson conclude this. The evidence for a debris flow origin for the Bigginjarga diamectite, a non-genitive term for a, a tillite rock, uh, seems compelling. The diamectite is massive and has random fabric, mound form top, marginal snouts or snouts uh, or singular snout, uh, projecting boulders and striated pavement. So. The implication of this result is that the main diagnostic features uh, for this ancient ice age are really not diagnostic at all. It's been yeah. known for a long time that the features of uh, tillite cannot be distinguished from a debris flow. Now, early workers didn't concern themselves with distinguishing between the two processes and just assumed ancient glaciation. So it's no surprise that the strata from the Earth uh, you know, have so many remnants of these ancient ice ages if they aren't actually remnants from ice ages. Right, so these claimed ancient ice ages are very likely uh, submarine or underwater debris flows, yep. a process that is consistent, obviously, with a global flood. Yep. You, you can check tillites off the list of geologic features that can't be supposedly explained by a global flood. Exactly. Well, what about chalk beds? Right. Chalk beds found all around the world. Most yep. people would have heard of or, or seen, whether in person or in photographs, you know, for example, the famous White Cliffs of Dover yes. uh, in southern England. 
And uh, the same beds of chalk are also found along the coast of France on the other side of the English Channel. Uh, the chalk beds extend inland from England and northern France, being found as far north and west as the Antrim coast and adjoining areas of, the, of Northern Ireland. Yeah, extensive chalk beds are also found in North America through, through Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee, uh, the Selma chalk, and in Nebraska and adjoining states, the Neobrara chalk. And in Kansas, the Fort Hayes chalk. There's three different uh, chalk layers in the U.S. Right. So the Latin uh, word for chalk is creta. And those familiar with the geological column and its evolutionary time scale will recognize this as the name of one of its periods, the, the Cretaceous period, right? So because most geologists believe in the geo geological evolution of the Earth's strata and features over millions of years, they've linked all these scattered chalk beds across the world into this so-called chalk age. Right. And uh, that is a supposedly a greater period, uh, millions of years of, uh, you know, chalk bed formation. Okay, so what is chalk? What are we talking about here? <laughs> well, it's, it's a porous, relatively soft and fine textured substance. It's normally white uh, or, or nearly white and mm -hmm. consists of all, almost wholly of calcium carbonate. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's thus a type of limestone and a very pure one at that. Mm -hmm. Now, under the microscope, chalk consists of tiny shells of countless billions of microorganisms composed of clear calcite set in a, a structureless matrix of fine-grained calcium carbonate. Right. Foraminifera and coccolithophores being two of the main microorganisms in chalk. Right, and this is the point where critics, and not only those in the evolutionist camp, but you know, uh, just long agers in general, have said that it's it's just not possible to explain the formation of these chalk beds in the White Cliffs of Dover via the geological action of the flood. And we'll discuss this in detail when we get back. Looking for a single resource that totally destroys evolution? You need Evolution's Achilles Heels. Authored by nine PhD scientists, the Evolution's Achilles Heels project involved examining areas evolutionists feel are their scientific strengths, such as natural selection, genetics and DNA, the fossil record, and radiometric dating. Discover how these areas and others are actually massive scientific weaknesses for evolution. Get Evolution's Achilles Heels, the Evolution Master Blaster. Order your copy at creation.com. Well, on this week's episode, we're talking about can certain geological features be explained by a global flood? And the feature we were discussing uh, were the massive chalk beds evolutionists point to in order to try to discredit the idea of a global flood. Right. Yeah, most geologists believe that the present is the key to the past. And so if chalk is made up of accumulated microorganisms, then logically look to see where such microorganisms live today right. and how and where their remains accumulate. Now, the, the deep sea sediments on the ocean floor today have an average thickness of about 450 meters, and it's, it's on the deep ocean floor that the purest calcium carbonate rich ooze, as, as it's called, has accumulated. Right. There's a, a variety of different sediments that blanket the deeper ocean floor, and among these are what are known as oozes, so-called because of uh, more, more than 30 percent of the sediment uh, consists of the shells of microorganisms. Indeed, about half of the deep ocean floors covered by light-colored uh, calcareous calcium carbonate-rich ooze generated down to depths of about 4,500 to around 5,000 meters. Okay. Geologists believe that these oozes form as a result of these microorganisms dying with the calcium carbonate shells falling slowly down to accumulate on the ocean floor. Slow accumulation is how most geologists believe that these chalk beds originally formed. Right. Now, the chalk beds of southern England are estimated to be around 405 meters thick and are said to span the complete duration of the so-called late Cretaceous geological period, estimated by evolutionists to account for between 30 to 35 million years of evolutionary time. Right. So a, a, sam a simple calculation reveals that the average rate of chalk accumulation, therefore, over this time period is 1.16 uh, and, and 3 point, uh, or, or, or 1.35 centimeters per 1,000 years, which is right at the lower end of today's observed accumulation rates. Right, so evolutionary geologists feel vindicated. Sure. Right? And, they, yeah. and the, the critics insist that there's, there's just too much chalk to have been originally deposited as calcareous ooze by the flood. Right, and well, you can see what's going on here, uh, can't you? Bible skeptics abandon the idea of a global flood then they apply uniformitarian ideas to what they observe and say that the explanation disproves the flood. 
which is the very thing you discarded out of hand in the first place. Right. So w what happens when you start with the idea that the flood actually did happen? Right. Well, two creations have done just that and have done much to provide a Bible-based response to these objections against flood geology. Ge geologist uh, Dr. Ariel Roth of the Geoscience Research Institute in Loma Linda, California, and John uh, Woodmerap. And first of all, um, reproduction rates of these microorganisms could have easily been vastly higher than today. Right, yes. Roth argues that, one, if, the high, if a high concentration of foraminifera of 100 per liter of ocean water were assumed, and two, a doubling time of 3.65 days, and three, an average of 10,000 foraminifera per gram of carbonate, then just the top 200 meters of ocean would produce 20 grams of calcium carbonate per square centimeter per year, right. or at an average sediment density of 2 grams per cubic centimeter, which is a deposition rate of 100 meters in a thousand years. Right, and that's not all. Coccolithophores, on the other hand, reproduce faster than foraminifera and are among the fastest growing uh, planktonic uh, algae, sometimes multiplying at the rate of 2.25 divisions per day. So Ross suggests that uh, his rates show it's possible to produce an average 100 meter thickness of coccoliths as calcareous ooze on the ocean floor in less than 200 years. There we go. So these. Uh carbonate secreting organisms mm -hmm. at optimum production rates could produce all of the calcareous ooze on the ocean floor today in the last 2,000 years easily. Right, however, that doesn't tackle the biggest problem uh, for creationists. As helpful as these uh, calculations are, they overlook one major relevant issue. Yes. These chalk beds were deposited during the flood. So the shells that are now in the chalk beds would have had to have been produced during the flood itself, not in the 1600 to 1700 years uh, of the pre-flood era. Why, and, and how can we explain that? Well, we'll be back shortly, so stay with us. How would our view of dinosaurs change if scientists found carbon-14 in their bones? Well, a group of geophysicists claim to have discovered exactly that, carbon-14 in dinosaur bones. This is indeed a shocking proposal for those who believe that the last dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago, because carbon-14 decays so fast that it could not possibly survive that long. There should not be one atom of carbon-14 present in dinosaur bones, if they really are as old as is usually claimed. After going to great lengths to rule out contamination, the researchers concluded that they had indeed found carbon-14 in dinosaur bone. These results seriously undermine the evolutionary story of long ages of Earth history. However, they fit nicely with biblical history, whereby dinosaurs lived only thousands of years ago, with their fossils forming from animals buried during Noah's flood. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, our subject this week is, can certain geological features be explained by a global flood? And we're still discussing the massive chalk beds evolutionists point to in order to discredit this idea that there was a global flood. Yes, uh, now what we're saying that, we're saying that during the flood, the shells that are now in the chalk beds would have had to have been produced during the flood itself. Mm. Now, why and how can we explain that? Mm -hmm. Well, the majority of creationist geologists um, regard these upper Cretaceous chalks as having been deposited very late in the flood. And that being the case, then the shells in the chalk beds would have had to have been produced during the flood itself, not in right. the years of the pre-flood era, because then these uh, chalk beds should have been deposited sooner rather than later during the flood event. Right. Now, scientists recognize that even today, shell accumulation is not steady, but highly episodic. Mm -hmm. And under the right conditions, significant increases in the concentrations of these marine organisms can occur, uh, just like uh, plankton blooms and, uh, and red tides, uh, for example. Uh, there are intense blooms of coccoliths that sometimes that, that, that cause white water situations yeah. and then the water near Jamaica, uh, where microorganism numbers sometimes have been reported increasing from 100,000 per liter to 10 million per liter of ocean water. That's right. And the reasons for these, these blooms, they're, they're 
kind of poorly understood, but the suggestions include uh, turbulence of the sea, wind, decaying fish, uh, nutrients from freshwater inflow and upwelling, and temperature. And without a doubt, all of these stated conditions would have been generated during the catastrophic, during, catastrophic global upheaval during the flood. Uh, during the flood. Yeah, and the, the, yeah. so rapid production of, of you know carbonate skeletons would be possible, obviously. Right. Uh, quite clearly, under cataclysmic flood conditions, including torrential rain, sea turbulence, decaying fish, obviously, and other organic matter, and, and violent volcanic eruptions going on during a flood associated with the fountains of the great deep breaking up, explosive blooms on a, on a, on a large and, re and maybe repetitive scale in the oceans are very realistically conceivable. Right, so the production of the, the necessary quantities of calcareous ooze to produce the chalk beds in, in the geological record in a short space of time at the close of the flood is also realistically conceivable. Yes, uh, violent volcanic eruptions would have produced copious quantities of dust and steam and would have uh, reduced ultraviolet radiation levels uh, from the sun. However, in the closing stages of the flood, the clearing and settling of this debris would have allowed increasing levels of sunlight to penetrate the oceans. That's right. And uh, ocean temperatures uh, would have been higher at the close of the flood because of the, the heat released from the, the, you know, the volcanic and magnet, uh, magmatic activity and would have also uh, been conducive to these explosive blooms, more, right. more temperature. Now, in, in addition, the, the same volcanic activity would have potentially released copious quantities of nutrients into the ocean waters, as well as lots of CO2, and so the necessary, and, and so those are necessary for the production of calcium carbonate by these uh, little microorganisms. Yeah, um, situations have been uh, known where pollution in coastal areas has contributed to the explosive multiplication of microorganisms in ocean waters, and to peak at concentrations of more than 10 billion per liter. Yeah, can you swim in that? I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> you uh, float in it. <laughs> yeah. So adapting some of Wood Morrope's calculations, if the uh, 10%. If the 10 percent of the Earth's surface that now contains chalk beds was covered in water, and it, it was it was near the beginning of the near the end of the flood, rather. And if that water explosively bloomed with up to 10 to to, to the to the 13th microorganisms per cubic meter of water down to a depth of, of say less than 500 meters from the surface, then it would only have taken two or three such blooms to produce the required quantity of microorganisms to be fossilized in the chalk beds that we see today. That's right. And then um, this just isn't some kind of defensive argument we're proposing right. here. Yeah. That the, you know, all these conditions just might have happened to try to you know, justify the biblical time scale. Yeah. The facts we observe today demand rapid f uh, formation of these chalk beds, not millions of years explanations. That's right. Uh, the, the purity of these chalk beds worldwide testifies to their catastrophic deposition because over millions of years, if we go with that, that scenario, lots of other sediments would have been mixed in with the chalk. Right. It, it strains believability to expect that the, you know, massive contamination events depositing other types of sediments wouldn't have occurred. That's right. So uh, the only uh, additional material in the chalk uh, that we see is fossils of uh, macroscopic organisms such as ammonites and other mollusks whose fossilization also requires rapid burial uh, because of their size, so this fits with, again, flood deposition. Exactly, yeah. So once again, it turns out that the biblical explanation for, of, of history makes better sense than the evolutionary history, and we'll be back with a little bit more. Creation.com is the world's most powerful internet resource for finding answers to questions about the origins debate. It includes an online store where you can browse through hundreds of the world's leading creationist books, DVDs, and related materials. Scientists and researchers from around the world have contributed more than 8,000 articles, many of which have appeared in leading creationist publications over more than 30 years. Creation or evolution? When the results are in, which one is supported by scientific observations? Find out at creation.com. All right, welcome back. That's been kind of a fun, mm -hmm. uh, fun episode to do, looking at tillites and chalk beds and showing how the Bible is, Bibles makes it, it's a lot better explanation. Mm -hmm. But uh, we want to switch gears a little bit. This is the in the news section where we take a look at something having to do with the creation evolution debate or age of the earth in the popular news. There's always something. Yeah, well, here's one. Uh, let me read a, a bit of this, this report. It's titled, Armor Up. Water Fleas Grow Helmets and Spines for Battle. Awesome. So it says, uh, 
Water fleas prepare for battle by growing armor that's customized to specific enemies, new research finds. Tiny Daphnia species develop impressive protective structures as they mature, including pointy tail spines and tough helmets. Now researcher Linda Weiss of Ruhr University, Bochum in Germany, and her colleagues have found the neurotransmitters that help water fleas customize their bodies in response to the chemical cues in their watery uh, environments. Dopamine in particular appears to code neuro signal, uh, neuronal signals into the endocrine, which are hormone signals, Weiss said in a statement. Daphnia is a genus comprising many species of the tiny crustaceans known as water fleas. Most are less than 0.2 inches five millimeters long and look much like translucent versions of the land-based fleas that give them their nickname. When juvenile Daphnia molt and develop a mature exoskeleton, they mold their bodies based on the chemicals they encounter in the water. And the water fleas use appendages called, called antennules to detect scents and chemicals left by predators, fish for example, or the upside down swimming insects called back swimmers. They then develop armored defenses in response to the threats they expect to face. These defenses are speculated to act like an anti-lock system, which means that they somehow interfere with the predator's feeding apparatus, Weiss said. Many freshwater fish can only eat small prey. So for example, Daphnia lumholtzi grows head and tail spines to make eating them more difficult. Yeah, wow. So, so here <laughs> is another example of incredible design, and, and we've done shows on this type of thing before. Right. Uh, what, uh, showing abilities like this are extremely difficult to explain within an evolutionary paradigm, design design features. Yeah, we've done shows uh, about uh, amazing animals like episode uh, four, uh, well, season four, episode 10, and shows like uh, when exactly were bad things created, remember that episode? Right, yeah. Where we yeah. talked about you know very similar things like the grasshopper to locust transformation where yeah. they have the exact same DNA, identical DNA, but uh, because of the epigenetic code, yes. uh, they can yeah. actually transform from a, a locust to a grasshopper back and forth. And, and we here mentioned you've... the Jekyll and Hyde transformation. It's almost like that. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and what we emphasize is that, that, sure, creatures are changing all the time, but that's not evolution. Mm -hmm. That's one of the key understandings that we need to get across. Yes, yes things change. Yeah. But when you see incredible design features like this in, in little water fleas' ability to, to select different defense abilities, the, the question is, how is such change possible? Yeah. And creation just makes so much more sense. Right, because all that information has to be packed into that little water flea, and then it's got these, these uh, abilities to, to just scan the environment and, it, oh, well, I'm going to need this defense and I'm going to need this in this environment. But another water flea in a different environment might... So yeah, we, so we've used the... Programmed instincts based on the environment to do certain things that are just incredible. Right. So yeah. explain that in an evolutionary way. That's, that's extremely, yeah. extremely difficult yeah. to do. We, we do that all the time in articles in Creation Magazine. The, creation, the magazine goes out to over 100 countries. It's been going for nearly 40 years now. Um, you can see a free copy, if you want a, a digital copy, you can view a free copy, creation.com slash free mag. And if you like it, you can subscribe. Next week on Creation Magazine Live, cloning and stem cell research, right or wrong. See you next week. <laughs>